Hello and welcome to Creative Women, Creative Business, Feminist Publishing, Design and Comics, a fantastic three-day festival organised by the Business of Women's Words Research Project in collaboration with the British Library. I'm going to have to all ask you all to forgive me if you watched uh, yesterday's events, because uh, the festival started yesterday, because I will be slightly repeating myself, uh, but I am compelled to do so because I have information that I need to impart. Um, my name is Polly Russell and I'm the British Library um, partner for the Business of Women's Words. I'm also the lead curator for the current exhibition at the British Library, Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights. Unfortunately, because of COVID, it is not possible to visit. However, the exhibition will be open until uh, August. So hopefully when we're out of this uh, hell, we will be able to open our doors and as many of you as possible will be able to visit. Um, it is absolutely right that this incredible festival is being held alongside the exhibition at the British Library, which so much celebrates women's tenacity, ingenuity, and of course, creativity in creating space, demanding change, insisting on rights, and of course, in making a living. Today's event, which is the second of our festival, uh, How to Sell a Feminist Story, is with two real industry leaders and innovators, Crystal Mahay Morgan and Jane Anger. And it is chain, cha chaired by Dr. Elena Kerlis, who is the research associate for the business of women's words. I'm about to hand over to her, but just a couple of housekeeping points. On your screen is a tab for the bookshop, uh, which lists all the publications for all of the contributors and speakers across the festival. This would, in, under ordinary circumstances, link to the British Library's on, online uh, website, but unfortunately this has had to close because of COVID, so instead we've linked to um, different retailers, so you can still uh, purchase people's books and check out their publications. Um, I always wanted to mention that beyond this fantastic festival this week, which is running today and tomorrow, um, the British Library also runs a whole host of wonderful events, and I just wanted to highlight a couple coming up in January, which are really relevant to the theme of this festival. Uh, we've got Alison Bechtel, the cartoonist, speaking later in the month. We have the artist and writer Laurie Anderson, doing an event for us and we also have the economist economist mariana mazacuto speaking with Gillian tett uh, on the 26th of the first so do think about coming to those events later in the month once you've done this wonderful festival finally please ask questions we can't wait to hear from our panelists but we really can't wait to hear from you as well. There is a tab or a, a, if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to see a space to uh, ask questions. And I know that everybody would be really interested to hear what you have to say as well. So I'm going to hand over now to Eleanor Kerlis and I look forward to seeing you later on in the festival. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Eleanor Kerlis, Research Fellow for the Business of Women's Words Project, and I'm delighted to introduce our two brilliant speakers for How to Sell a Feminist Story. Our first speaker, Jane Anger, has spent most of her book trade career on the retail side. Starting in medical book selling, she became a founder member of the legendary feminist Silver Moon Bookshop, which opened in 1984. She was active in both the Women in Publishing Network and the Feminist Book Fortnights of the 1980s. Having run a general bookshop and been a publisher's rep, from 1999, she ran academic bookshops for the University of Leicester. Since 2016, she has worked at Five Leaves Bookshop in Nottingham, an independent radical bookshop. Five Leaves initiated the restart of Feminist Book Fortnight in 2018, and Jane coordinates this national promotion for about 50 independent bookshops. Our second speaker, Crystal Mahi Morgan, began her career as a freelance journalist at the age of 16, writing for publications such as The Guardian and The Face magazine. At the age of 19, she became marketing manager for Raindance Film Festival, and after graduating from SOAS University, she embarked on a career within publishing, firstly working as literary assistant at Peter, Fraser and Dunlop, then joining Random House in 2009. Her most recent role at Penguin Random House was online digital account manager, where she was responsible for managing digital retailer relationships with the likes of Apple and Google. She resigned from Penguin Random House at the end of 2014 to realize a long held vision 
of bringing fresh voices and new stories to market in pioneering ways. In 2015, she established the storytelling lifestyle brand Own It, a publisher and agency that publishes and produces powerful stories across books, music, art, and film. This panel discussion is all about how to bring radical stories to a wider audience, to gain insight into the workings of the book trade and how to transform it into a more inclusive, more feminist industry. Before I hand over to Jane and Crystal, I wanted to give you a very brief overview of these different but extremely complementary creative businesses. The feminist businesses of the 1980s, such as Silver Moon, which Jane Anger co-founded, were enormously important contributors to the transmission of feminist ideas. Books and reading cultures were absolutely central to the development of feminism at this time, not only in spreading the word of feminist activism, but also in reshaping the literary canon, the publishing industry, and even the way we use language. As Beatrix Campbell, a feminist activist, put it, we ate the literature that was pouring out of the women's liberation movement. We ate it. You just read everything and it impacted massively on your life. The original feminist book fortnight was also established in the 80s with hundreds of bookshops and public libraries across the UK taking part and rapidly became one of this country's most successful annual book trade promotions. Although many of the feminist and radical bookshops that were established in the 80s declined in number during the 90s. Last year, 2020, independent bookshops in the UK somehow managed to increase in number, and we currently have the highest number of independent bookshops in the UK since 2013. Five Leaves in Nottingham, founded in 1996, is one of the stalwarts. One of the main challenges faced by feminist and radical bookshops has always been financial, how to reconcile profit with feminist purpose, how to balance the books without compromising on your principles. The same is true for radical writers, how to pitch and sell radical stories in a mainstream market. This is where radical publisher agents like Own It, founded by our second speaker, Crystal Mahe Morgan, come in. Own It, unusually, unites a publisher and an agency under one banner and nurtures the diverse talent that eventually finds its way onto the shelves of radical bookshops. Own It does this by rethinking the economics of the book trade and offering greater royalties to its artists and writers than conventional agents in order to attract more diverse, traditionally marginalized voices. As a publisher, as well as an agent, they are able to support their writers all the way through to publication and are doing vital work to make an overwhelmingly white industry more inclusive. In the wake of the worldwide Black Lives Matter protest movement last year, Own It has been joined by other pioneering initiatives such as the Black Writers Guild, which seeks to ensure that the whole supply chain is more knowledgeable about and committed to publishing diverse voices. The work of agencies like Crystals and, and bookshops like Jane's is of absolutely contemporary relevance, and together they support a radical book through its entire life cycle, from its inception to its realization and promotion and into the hands of the reader. Here's Jane Anger, who will tell you more about the revolutionary work of feminist bookselling. Hi, thanks, Helena. I'm going to talk about what happens in bookshops once a book is published, but this is also a story. It's a story of how bookshops can influence publishing or how bookshops can make space for poorly represented or underrepresented voices and how we can make spaces for conversations, which can also be stories. Once a book is published, it needs to reach its audience, the reader. Now, publishers do a lot of this work, but it's also where booksellers come in. So I'd like to talk a bit about that, how that happens. First, a little bit about Five Leaves and how we do things, and then specifically about how independent booksellers worked hard on one particular project, Feminist Book Fortnight, a joint celebration of feminist writing with 50 other fem with, with 50 other independent bookshops. So more of feminist book fortnight in a moment. The first five leaves, which was actually founded in 2013 by Ross Bradshaw. It's a radical bookshop open in a small alleyway bang in the center of Nottingham. It's radical in the widest sense. Lots of fiction and poetry, of course, uh, sections on general politics, left leaning, 
anarchism, feminism, the environment. We've always had a Black Lives section and we've always had a very diverse children's section. We stock books and put on events that seek to make the world a better place, a more just place. So if you could put on the slide of the team, please. We are a team of seven people, um, mostly part-time. And uh, in a minute, a slide will come up with just five of us. There we go. Um, so we have Ross Bradshaw on the left. We have Simon Griffiths, Mayor Wilkins, who was recently a, a judge for the Costa Poetry Prize. Myself, Pippa Hennessy, who does a lot of our design work and online events. And we also have two other members of staff, Carl Davis and Dr. Deirdre O'Byrne. The shop is well known for in pre-COVID times for holding over a hundred events a year. It's a small shop, a tiny shop. We can get in 45 to 50 people at a push. Um, we have a very supportive and diverse customer base. And we also use other bigger venues. So if we find the bookings are going up for something, we can hire a space that takes 100, 200. And we've done events with 300 and 400 people. I'll just explain a little bit about our approach. We're not interested in pushing to make sales, making a customer buy things they don't want, but in showing what we think is interesting. It's what we call curation in the book trade. We select stock that we think customers will be interested in. Often we'll try something on the basis of a conversation with a colleague or a customer. And I'll give you a um, concrete example of that. We started a section on autism because a few customers were ordering books on autism and neurodiversity. And then we did some events focus, focusing on autism and they were packed. That, and that's typical. We try to trust that there will be an audience and there usually is. We, we just have to make sure we promote it properly. Pre-COVID, we were regularly full for a wide range of events. Rarely fiction though, which is interesting to some people, sales of non-fiction actually outstrip fiction and that's reflected in the range of our events. Now we do events online and it seems we have a YouTube channel, which I'll refer to a bit more in a minute. Our job is to pick up on the interesting poet, the academic researcher writing an accessible book on women's labour, in that case, Nan Sloan, or on lesbian lives, that was Jane Trace, or on women artists, and that was Griselda Pollock, or on black radicalism, Kahindi Andrews, and see if we can do an event. That's where we take our approach, we drive that agenda. So for example, we mused about why now there are less books on women artists than there were in the 1980s. And then Bloomsbury decided to republish Griselda Pollock and Rizika Parker's book, um, Old Mistresses, Women, Art and Ideology. It's as important now, that book, as it was then. So we offered to do an online event, which we did, and Griselda was brilliant. And that video has now been viewed more than 600 times. So that was our way of amplifying and contributing to a conversation that needed to keep going about the lack of books in that area. And that conversation needs to keep going. Now on to Feminist Book Fortnight. I was in book selling in the eighties, and this is a story of about a small part we played in some bookseller activism. So I was in book selling in the 80s and a co-founder of Silver Moon, as Eleanor said. That was a feminist book fortnight on Charing Cross Road, when there were several feminist presses in the UK. To name a few, Virago, of course, the Women's Press, Sheba, Pandora, Black Women Writing, Only Women, and more. Some mainstream publishers were also publishing feminist books because there were a couple of key editors in place. But these were hard-won gains in a predominantly white, male, heterosexual industry. There were, at that time, also the Feminist Book Fortnight and the Feminist Book Fair that Eleanor's referred to. But it was overwhelmingly a very straight-laced industry. So fast forward to 2017, it's hard to imagine this now, as things have changed a lot in the last three years. But in 2017, myself and Ross Bradshaw, who owns Five Leaves and is also a radical bookseller from the 80s, found ourselves having several conversations about the lack of diversity in the books we were seeing published. Almost no books with children of colour in them, almost no feminist books, almost nothing by black British writers or any black writers for that matter. Stats showed that women, books by women were not getting reviewed as often as those by men. 
and that some writers were reporting that they were much more likely to get published in the, if they had a female protagonist. And the heavy lifting on this, publishing the interesting stuff, was nearly always being done by independent presses, small independent presses. Now we knew that there was an audience for feminist books, especially among young women, teachers, librarians and others who were coming into the shop. But it felt like most publishers weren't interested. At the same time as we were having this conversation at Five Leaves, voices were being raised in the publishing industry about the lack of a diverse workforce in the book trade generally, and specifically in the publishing industry where the decisions are made about what to publish. There was the start of a debate. So we decided to make an intervention in that debate from the book selling side, and also crucially for us from outside London. Remember there were no big budgets on offer here, I rang around other independent bookshops and radical bookshops and asked a question. If we started a feminist book fortnight for 2018 to celebrate feminist books, would you take part? And actually people cheered down the phone, not just radical shops, but small independent shops that knew that their customers were looking for more than was being published. We were also looking to make spaces where conversations and discussions could happen. This was key to our approach. And frankly, it's the way a lot of booksellers work. It was really clear to us that customers want, wanted diverse children's books and also to discuss ideas. And so we aimed to provide some forums for that. And of course we want to sell books, it's what we do. But when we discuss selling books as booksellers, we often mean making the space for readers to find them, to find the place to chat about them. We were not really interested in jumping on a publisher's bandwagon for a big author, although if that author is interesting to us, we will do that. We were making our own agenda. And that agenda was, let's find and showcase and discuss the books that move the discussion on. In the end, 52 indie bookshops took part. And in 2019, we ran it again. It was up to each shop to do what they wanted. So there was no central organization of events. A window they could do just do a window or an in-store display or one event or more there's no big budget just my labor at five leaves so i coordinated the website and the social media and my colleague pippa hennessy designed the posters and five leaves put in 200 pounds of printing posters that we sent out to each shop three feminist libraries took part as well as a bookshop in rome and a bookshop in venice and i didn't get to go there some shops put on six events or more so Houseman's and Lighthouse and ourselves, we each put on about six events. We ran a, an event with the local cinema. There was a very good documentary about Ursula Le Guin, uh, a film documentary about her. We persuaded the cinema to put that on. Uh, they had to move it to a bigger screen because they had so many takers. So that was just one of the events we did in Nottingham. And that again was about working with other people. All the shops, all the venues welcomed the dialogue that it provoked. It was, a very, it was very successful in showing that readers wanted diverse books. And when Black Lives, Ma Black Lives Matter took off last year, lots of bookshops did displays as well as a way of being part of that discussion. Lots of radical shops have always had Black Lives sections in their shops, but this was on a different level. So for example, Woodbridge Emporium, a small independent bookshop in Suffolk, the owner got personal abuse for putting on a Black Lives Matter window and that needs recognizing. Feminist books, lastly, feminist books need not to be seen as a passing trend by publishers. It's happened before. Likewise, we need to ensure that books on black lives don't become a passing trend in publishing. And finally, coordinating feminist book fortnight really highlighted something for me. Our history often gets erased. There is no documentation for what a lot of what went on in the 80s. There are some archives, and they're very good, but they're patchy and they far from reflect the activities and networks that got things done. And it is networks that get things done. It wasn't online then. Feminism was seen as a trend by a publishing industry that absorbed the ethos of the backlash and feminist books stopped being published for a long time. So I'm really conscious that what's going on now could easily be forgotten or unhappened. So, Reflecting something Nan Sloan said at an event at Five Leaves is, women, curate your archives, don't throw it away. 
the men keep their archives, we need to make sure we keep ours. The programme of events that Bookshop put on in 2018 and 19 gives you a very good snapshot of a little bit of Bookshop act activism in this debate. If you're interested in seeing the range of events and who participated, the 19, 2019 programme is up on the website. Go have a look. And I'm happy to answer questions at the end. But here is just a few slides of some of the 2019 Feminist Book Fortnight events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Um, it's fascinating to learn about the reinvigorated feminist book fortnight. Now I'm going to hand you over to Crystal, who will tell you more about uh, her visionary agent publisher, Own It. Hi, thanks so much. It's so good to be here. It's so inspiring to hear Jane speak about the work that's been happening for a long time and continues to happen. I think there's so much alignment with what Jane's doing and what so many independent medical bookshops are doing and what we're trying to do at Own It. Um, by way of background in terms of where the vision came from or how it all started, I worked in mainstream publishing for maybe 10 years. Um, part of that was at a literary agency, mainly within publishing. Um, and I, I was really frustrated. I was really frustrated. So this is you know, we're talking about 2012, 2013, 2014. I was really frustrated with just the lack of voices that were coming through, something that Jane touched upon, um, the lack of representation um, in many different forms, you know, whether that be race or class or gender or, you know, uh, across the board, there was just such a lack of certain voices coming through. And the result of that was twofold. There were very talented writers who were not being given opportunities, um, even though our culture and our society would have been richer if their books were out. Um, and audiences were being ignored. And I think there was whole audiences. I sat in many acquisition meetings, for example, and really interesting books would come into the meetings or things that I found really interesting. And you could see by the way they were being discussed that there was an assumption that there'd be no audience for books like this. And in that sense, they wouldn't be commercially viable. And, and so therefore there'd be no need to invest in them. And you could see this kind of becoming a self-fulfilling process prophecy almost because the way a lot of acquisition meetings work within publishing is you look at comparable titles so you're deciding whether you take on a book a lot of mainstream publishers think okay what other books like this have sold well and if they've sold well then maybe this is something worth us taking on so I started to see lots of patterns forming in terms of the output and the, the things being published or not published, but also the audiences that were being catered for. Um, alongside that, and again, something that Jane touched upon is the workforce within the industry, because then I started to think to myself, why is it that this is the case? How have we got to this situation when we live in such a kind of eclectic, rich cultural kind of society? Um, and then it was the workforce. The workforce was very monochrome. It was very similar in the people that were not only in the industry, but then also progressed, say, to the boardrooms and the, the kind of decision-making kind of um, roles. And as someone who's very not traditional publishing in so many ways, kind of um, British, Asian, working class woman, very outspoken, very kind of um, confident in myself and, and where I come from and not wanting almost to change that to fit in. Um, that was something that was not kind of very publishing and not something that publishing was used to. Um, and I think now we're very lucky in that um, the conversation around diversity and representation and, and the need for it and the importance of it has moved on quite a lot than say 10 years ago. And there's more of an understanding or at least, you know, more of a mainstream understanding that that's something that needs to be addressed. But I think probably as Jane has experienced, Previously, it was something that was very much in the sidelines. It was something that was very much a marginalized conversation as opposed to something that people thought everyone needed to be part of. Um, so all of these frustrations, 
essentially led me to feel like, well, it's not working in the places that I am. So let me step out and let me try to make something work um, in my own vision and, and in my own kind of understanding of what's going to take our, our British publishing industry and, and therefore society to a better place. Um, so I, I set up Own It. Um, I co-run it with Jason, who, so whereas I come from a publishing background, Jason comes from a music background. He was in a UK hip hop group um, in the kind of uh, 90s, late 90s. So what he'd call a lifetime away, but he very much comes from that music background. So when we set up Own It, we decided we wasn't going to call it a publishers or a record label or any, any particular label. It was just going to be a storytelling lifestyle brand and the idea would be that stories are at the heart of it and however those stories are told whichever medium whichever industry whatever makes the best sense to tell that story that's what we're going to do so in setting ourselves up like that we became very open in the ways we could release stories and engage with audiences and for us the key thing is always artists and audiences all the kind of middle industry stuff we're less kind of interested in in a way like we just want to connect great stories to audiences who who want to kind of read and engage and kind of consume those so that that kind of created lots of opportunity to work in very different ways to traditional publishing um, in the sense that when we launched books for example we do it through an event and our events would be very different so rather than what I've been used to in terms of a Waterstones event with some cheap wine and you know two hours and we we mingle and there's like speeches and a little clap at the end we was like actually how can we get a whole new audience to books because if there's certain audiences who haven't been engaged in books previously that has nothing to do with the audiences that has everything to do with what's coming out of the industry and not only what's coming out of the industry but the way it's coming out so we didn't necessarily want to try to get people into spaces that they weren't comfortable in so there's loads of people you know even some of our writers in the past have said I'm just not comfortable walking in something like a Waterstones or a Foils or a, a bookshop environment. It's not something I've grown up with. It's not something I'm used to. It's not something that I would choose to do if I had a day off for spare time. So we started to think about how can we take books to them and how can we take conversations to them in a way that is within their comfort zone and they would find enjoyable and choose to do. So our first launch, for example, our first ever book, um, Incidentally, it was in 2016, and it happened to be the only book published by a Black British debut male novelist in 2016, which is kind of crazy. And it's crazy that it was coming from us, a small independent publisher with no budget as our first book. Um, but what we did was we did an event at the Hackney Empire, which is a theatre in East London. It seats 1,300 people. And we sold that out. And we sold that out because we didn't market it as a book event. We marketed it as an event. It had hip hop artists, it had poets, it had musicians, it had comedians. It had people that a wide cross section of society would be interested in coming to see. And often that's the reason they bought the ticket. But when they turned up, they realized that actually it's a book event and it's a book event. It was a hardback kind of novel debut fiction. And we sold over 600 copies on the night as well as selling out a 1,300 capacity venue. So I think that's a really interesting insight into the fact that all of those acquisitions meetings that I'd sat in where people like, there's no audience for a certain type of book, this isn't gonna be commercially viable, this just isn't worth our investment. That event actually and that publication just dismantled that whole way of thinking and all of those assumptions that I've been hearing for so long within my career. Um, and then from that we kind of developed so we did events we did kind of uh, multimedia digital books which had songs in them we kind of really pushed the boundaries of what storytelling was and how you could release stories in different ways to engage new audiences maybe about two years ago now um, we set up the agency side of the business that happened very organically it happened because 
where previously we've seen a gap in the market in terms of publishers publishing kind of representative voices in interesting ways that were attracting new audiences we started to see that actually there were really kind of veteran writers who have been doing it for a long time who are kind of such important parts of our British literary canon but couldn't find agents that they felt understood their editorial approach wasn't trying to make them write about saris and curry if they was asian for example or wasn't trying to make them tell just one narrative for example a slave narrative if they happen to be a black british writer or a black writer so we we started to see that actually there was a real lack in terms of representation where there was people who both understood the editorial aspect of what writers needed but also understood the terms the negotiation the business and and kind of being able to get them the best deal and marrying those two things which essentially is what every writer needs in an agent so that happened very organically our first client was courtier newland um, who's just had a book um, published called a uh, river called time um, and it's a sci-fi um, fiction which is set in an alternative world where slavery and colonism never happened colonialism never happened and it's really interesting because he's actually he started writing this book about 18 years ago um, and it was essentially in a draw for 18 years not for lack of him trying but because he couldn't find the right agent because he couldn't find the right publisher and a lot of the feedback he was getting is this is not how sci-fi is written or if you're going to write a book, why don't you write a book in this genre? So he previously published a book called The Scholar. That was his debut. It's a pioneering kind of cult classic. It was one of the first kind of black British books where you saw British kind of slang and, you know, kind of lingo and dialects and authentically represented by a writer who came from the world that he was creating. Um, and it's really interesting that what his book does is as a sci-fi book, it redefines who can write sci-fi, how sci-fi can be written and who sci-fi is for. And I think that very much defines what we're trying to do and why we feel it's important for us to exist and to kind of push boundaries. Um, as, a, as an agency, we work across um, books, obviously, but also film and TV and, and many other areas. So going back to that idea that it's just storytelling at the heart of what we do. Um, and because we've always been set up to represent eclectic verses, di diverse voices, and I say diverse in the the kind of most diverse sense of the word diversity. I think sometimes when we when we use these phrases and these labels, we start to think of them in very restricted ways. So, you know, diverse in publishing comes synonymous with race, but actually there are so many other aspects of diversity which have been neglected. Um, we've heard from Jane for a long time and, and, you know, class is a real issue. I mean, in terms of me trying to progress in mainstream publishing, a lot of my barriers were probably because I came from a working class background as much as it was that I kind of, I'm not white, you know, I'm not a man or I'm not. So there's many areas that are kind of neglected. And when we think about diversity, we need to think about it in the in the broadest sense. And of, of course, excuse me, <coughs> of course, like women, women voices and, and, and women's voices again not being restricted to certain stories or within certain genres is something that's always been an issue just like in a way you know women in boardrooms is it, it part of own its existence and the fact that it's a black and brown owned business with myself and Jason the fact that there's a female owner co-owner you know these things are important because going back to the workforce if we have eclectic workforces with people and owners and and decision makers that's going to affect kind of the output that's coming out so I, I think in terms of female voices and feminist voices that's also something that's often been neglected and I just wanted to share maybe some of the the voices that we have published or we do represent that we're very proud of and hopefully gives you a sense of kind of the very different kinds of voices we work with, but also the different ways that we work. So if we could go to my first slide. 
Um, so MC Angel is a, an amazing kind of inspirational woman. So she's a very uncompromising white working class queer voice. Um, she's written her memoir about her struggles really growing up um, in poverty on a council estate in Camden to Catholic homophobic parents as a young lesbian trying to find her way in the world. And I think not only is she in herself a powerful kind of inspirational story but she's also a brilliant writer and and she's empowering and I mean one thing that I would say about all of our writers is they're very political but not in an overt sense they're political in the very personal way so in the sense that just their existence and the stories that they're telling make a difference to the world um, and if we go on to the next slides you can see some of the different ways that we've worked with her so she's actually an MC she's kind of a hip pop MC and a poet that really lent itself to doing lots of live events with her lots of kind of interesting audiences coming to those events again not necessarily to to have a book event but to kind of just experience kind of music and and poetry and comedy um, but then through that finds her book um, so actually this is just different examples this is some photos from one of her events um, which you can see kind of was set up more as a music concert, to be honest, than a book event. Ify Adenuga is someone that we've recently published and in many ways the opposite end of, of the scale. She's kind of an immigrant mother who's come from Nigeria, water on Nigeria. She's raised um, four children who have been dubbed some of the most influential British creatives. So um, her eldest son Skepta won the Mercury Music Prize. Um, and she just, again, is a very powerful feminist voice, one that probably we're not used to hearing, especially when we're talking about diverse stories recently, we hear them from second generation perspectives, but not necessarily that first generation who came over. Because within publishing, if you're over kind of 50, you can't have a debut kind of book because you know you have to, of course, be 21 or 22 to do that. So again, with us publishing her, it's to say that voices are valid in many different forms and are pre-notions of a debut having to come from a 21 or 22 year old kind of doesn't make sense because sometimes you need to live and have those experiences before you can kind of communicate those in powerful ways through books. So that's just some of the press that she got. Kirsty Latoya, we've published an art poetry book with her. Um, she's very kind of interested in empowering positive images of young black women. Um, and again, a very different end of the spectrum to the others in the sense that those are memoirs, this is an art poetry book. So different genres, different formats and a different voice within feminism because it's not a monolithic kind of one, one idea, one ideal fits all. And again, these are some of the events that we've done with her. On the next slide, you can see some of her artwork, which has very positive images and through her art, raise many kind of interesting discussions. For Selena Godden, um, a feminist voice, a poet, someone who's been in the game 20 years, um, is publishing her debut novel, Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death, um, at the end of January. And she imagines death as a working class black woman. And through her book, she she's exploring that erasure of voices and the people that you don't see, you know, we imagine death as a man because everything is imagined as a man, whether good or bad or, you know, and she's actually trying to address what it's like when you reimagine what things can be. Um, and again, she's done many interesting things. And then finally, if we flick through to some of the last slides, Rose Cartwright, so talk about diversity. For us, like mental health is part of a diversity conversation that often is ignored. and. Rose wrote a really powerful book um, called Pure, which was about a form of OCD, which um, is experienced through intrusive sexual thoughts. And it's an uncommon form of OCD, but a very kind of, um, a very serious one that many people suffer from. And it, was, it took great courage for her as a young woman to say, this is something that I, I suffer from and I want to talk about and I want to open a conversation about to make sure there's other supported young women. 
Um, so hopefully from that, you can see that even within representation and diversity, we try to be as diverse as possible. Um, and it's just really important for us to build on the work such as Jane and such as so many other publishers who have gone before us, who often aren't recognized or aren't sung about, but should be because we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're just contributing to a long line of history of people fighting for more radical voices to be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. I'm going to open up the floor to discussion um, and to questions from the audience. We've already had quite a few questions come through, um, so thank you. Keep them coming. Um, we really want to hear from you. Um, we've um, we've had some some great feedback as well. Somebody saying that's incredible. Five leaves, five leaves books. Um, that's a comment for you, Jane. Um, I was going to kickstart with a question of my own before. Um, moving through some of these audience questions. Um, and this is both for Jane and for Crystal. I was, I was gonna ask you um, how you manage a marketplace, which can be so unpredictable. I mean, Jane, you, you touched on this when you talked about passing trends and, and Crystal talked about this as well. Uh, how, how do you sell books without resorting to, to stereotypes? Shall I go first? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we need to resort to stereotypes. I think what we see sometimes when we get the books from publishers is that they will kind of slot it into a genre or a stereotype and give us a reference. Um, we kind of tend to look at it afresh and think, um, you know, who, who will want this book? And we'll, we'll take a punt. And even if something doesn't fit into something, we'll take a punt. And if something doesn't fit in a shop, in a bookshop section, and that's always an issue for booksellers is something, if something's cross genre, where are you gonna put it? Um, on the table. So if you put it on the table, the person who needs to find it will find it. And then you'll find that a book you didn't even understand yourself and you're not quite sure what it's about, put it on the table. It'll, it'll keep ticking over and then eventually you get to learn more about it. So I think um, inevitably there are stereotypes, um, but, but I don't think that the writers that we are interested in or the writers we stock or our customers are looking for those stereotypes, really. I think they're, they're looking for something interesting to read. Um, I think for us, because we think so much about audience and, and writers and then try to just be all of those middle things in between, we we go direct you know a, a huge part of our, our sales comes through our direct website or uh, a huge part of our sales comes through hand sending at our events where we've got audiences of 600 700 people where we do work with bookshops is always the indie bookshops because they're much more dynamic they're much more forward thinking they're much more about curation and they understand audiences in much more savvy ways but essentially we never trouble ourselves too much with the things that currently exist and the structures and the, the routes to market that currently exist because traditionally they've not always worked. So we just really think about creating our own routes to market, whether that be through events, our online website, or, or partnering with the independent bookshops who are forward thinking enough for that not to be an issue for. Thank you. Um, I've got a, a great question here from Claire, um, who's asking how feminist businesses, but I think we could also include yeah, radical businesses um, under that rubric, manage competition in a market. So a, a similar question, I guess, but, but slightly different. And, and Claire asks, does competition sometimes help even feminist or radical businesses improve? Yes, I'd, I'd, I'd say yes. Um, there's always competition I and mean, five leaves is deliberately cited within five minutes of waterstones we wanted people to be going able to go from one to the other and they do um com competition in the sense of fair competition is is fine um so we could look at for example um you know when amazon discounts books that's not fair competition so that kind of competition um that, that was seen as a major threat to, the, to booksellers for a long time, but what's happened is actually more and more people are coming to actual bricks and mortar bookshops and the, the old adage of use it or lose it is very much sunk in with the publishers and, and that kind of easy trope that um, 
the bookshops are dead is, is clearly been disproved in the last five or six years. You know, we are thriving. Um, so um, it's more, I, I find that the lovely thing about the books industry is the cooperation, not the competition. It's, and if you talk to people in other industries, they're always amazed by the amount of cooperation between seeming competitors, that we, we are a, a, a cooperative industry um, a lot in the way we work. Um, I, I agree. I think healthy competition is a good thing. I think when that's balanced with healthy cooperation, that's an even better thing. Um, for us personally, we're a hugely commercial business. Um, sometimes I feel that the conversation about having kind of eclectic voices, more representative voices, is tied in with somehow it needing to be charitable. And that's not the way we personally see it, where we're hugely commercial and there's no reason why we shouldn't be because we publish incredible voices which stand up against any other voice who have huge audiences, which have universal appeal. And for us, it's never about marginalizing us in any way, whether that be creatively or commercially. So we're hugely ambitious, we're hugely commercial. We never want to be the only independent publisher publishing the types of voices that we are or just independent publisher at all if there's other brilliant independent publishers doing what they're doing and keeping us on our toes and, and likewise us keeping them on their toes for us that's healthy competition because everyone will benefit in terms of the stories that are being released and the way they're being released so healthy competition is always a good thing for us. Thank you both for speaking to that with such energy. Um, I've been really struck by like your shared drive to, to share stories with, with audiences. I think it's brilliant. Um, so we've got we've got a great comment, which I just wanted to share. This is, um, I already shared a, a comment um, for, for Jane and Five Leaves. This is uh, from Amy Rag, who just wanted to say that I come from a poetry background and absolutely love MC Angel and Selena Godden. Um, Selena particularly is an absolute legend and I'm totally delighted to find out that Crystal's agency own it. Um, Great work, I'm gonna be following everything you're doing. Thank you for a great speech. So a bit of feedback there. Um, and then I was also gonna ask a question uh, from Linda, um, again, to both of you, um, but I, I guess this is maybe slightly more um, tilted towards Jane, but I'd be interested to hear Crystal's take on this as well. From what you can see in your sales, do you think nonfiction is the best way to represent voices that are not heard rather than fiction? I I, if you looked at sales, non-fiction outstrips fiction, but uh, is it the best way? Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I've heard Elif Shafak, Elif Shafak speak very eloquently about the importance of telling different stories, and she does it through fiction, and, and how that is so important to get people to understand people that are different from you, and writer after writer and reader after reader has said that. Um, so. Um, in terms of value, I think it's equal. Um, in terms of sales, I have to say that for us, non-fiction, well, it's true in the industry, actually. Everybody talks as if the industry is about fiction. It's actually non-fiction outsells fiction all the time. Um, so it's whatever route the reader wants. And I think picking up a bit on what Crystal said, you know, we've recently gone back to having a, a science fiction fantasy section. That's a, a great way to explore lots of ideas and it's been traditionally explored by people like Ursula Le Guin and, and lots of different writers have explored that for different realities and, and, and therefore a route to making change. Uh, yeah, I think back to the idea of storytelling first and audience first and, and I think any blanket statements from our perspective is never something that we want to adhere to. I suppose traditionally speaking, nonfiction outsells fiction in that sense. And, and you know, that's that's almost considered a safer market um, than, than fiction, which maybe traditionally has been a smaller market. But in terms of our books personally, we can't really divide it in terms of nonfiction or fiction. And, you know, like I say, we've done art books and we've done photography books and we've, so it's very much about, I think, how you package something and how you deliver that to an audience that is the audience for that book. And I think anytime we get into kind of ideas that this is going to sell better or this is going to be the better way to tell a story, we're almost going down a slippery slope because each story, each author, each audience in its own merit. 
Thank you. Crystal, I've got a question for you from Marta. Um, do you have any advice for an aspiring radical indie publisher and fellow SOAS graduate? Um, yes, like, please exist. Um, we need you. <laughs> um, I think it's really hard. It's really, really tough. If you're going to get into it, like, know that. Know that it's it's the most rewarding thing in the world. And every day I wake up and I'm part of something that I feel is, is really trying to make a change, even if in a very small way. But with those rewards does come a lot of kind of pressure and a lot of burden. And in many ways, we do have to try to exist in some kind of structure that is already existing. And often there's many barriers and, you know, whether that's through distribution, whether that's through press, whether that's through all of the things that as a publisher you need to plug into, often it's much harder as an independent independent publisher first but then particularly as a radical independent publisher um, and what you often find is there are diluted versions of what you're doing or the stories you're telling or the voices you're representing which people find more palatable and therefore promote more so I think you have to have a very thick skin but having said that it's the most rewarding thing in the world so yeah please do it get in touch like we the more of us that exist I think the more we can turn the dial within the mainstream because as Jane said earlier it's always it's always been the fringes whether it's independent bookshops independent publishers that's always where the real work the heavy lef lifting's been done and then over time that kind of filters in and feeds through to the mainstream and then we turn the wheel again and we come with something a bit more radical so so yeah it's tough but it's worth it and we need you it's brilliant i'm starting to feel like i want to go into publishing um, I've got a question for Jane uh, this time. Um, this is from Jing, um, who says, I was really interested in your point about archiving. Is oral history a good way to capture the history of women in the radical book trade? It is, and, and I find myself at an age where I've, I've been approached now. I am a bit of history. Um, for, for, I've done some um, archiving of my, my, my experience uh, in the 80s. Um, so for instance, there's a very good archive um, oral history archive being done by Women in Publishing, um, which which is many voices from that time and, and the kind of campaigns and the, the differences we were trying to make then. And if anybody's interested in, in hearing that, it gives a very good um, shot of uh, the, the, the kind of uh, things we were trying to achieve then and what, what individuals' life experiences were within that. Um, and I have other friends who are um, ex-booksellers who've been interviewed for various oral history projects and I know that a lot of that is under the aegis of, of the British Library um, so, so that's very important I think also there's a there's a um, become aware recently when somebody talked to me that there's a very good archive of a lot of the feminist publishing stuff at the Women's Library at LSE um, and that's another important archive um, but there is a there is a lot missing. So the oral history is great. I had to say that when I was being interviewed, I did not forget a lot though. You know, so you need to keep having the conversations because it makes you remember more of what, what went on. Um, and a lot of it is not searchable on the internet. So it's, it's, it's really important. The Women in Publishing Archives are a really good one to look at. Thank you, Jane. Um, yeah, I like that idea of oral history as an ongoing process. Um, I think that's also really interesting the way that, that yeah, conducting oral histories can actually get start memories flowing yeah. um, and kind of yeah get, create history in that way um I've got another comment to share with you um this is from Anna Mota I'm um, just saying thank you so much for such a brilliant presentation from all um thank you so much for this opportunity I just thought I'd share that um I've got a, a really interesting question from uh from Lizzie um who's asking what would you class as a feminist fiction story is just having a strong female protagonist enough or should feminist ideas weave deeper into the story? Um, I'm gonna sound like a broken record. I don't have a predefined definition of what a feminist story is. When I see it and I read it and I feel it, I know it. I think saying it's just about who writes it or it's just about what's written or it's just about whether there are ideologies in it or not you know to me 
that just doesn't ring true. I know it when I see it and I don't have any predefined notions of what it is before, before I see it. I agree, absolutely spot on, yeah. Oh, great, um, I think maybe we have room for one more question and then I'm gonna have to wind up unfortunately, which is a great shame because we do have more questions than I have time to ask and I'm really sorry if I haven't got to your question. Um, but I guess maybe a, a kind of, yeah, a roundup question would be good at this point. I just wanted to ask you both, and I think I know what the answer is, but it'd be great to hear in your words, do you think the marketplace can be a place for justice and change? Um, I don't think it's, it's whether it can be, I think it should be. I, I, I suppose it depends what you mean about marketplace. I think from a commercial point of view, commercial things are commercial things. But I think what sells and what people are interested in are things that reflect our experiences. And, you know, whether that's through escapism or whether that's through reality, I think the, the power of storytelling is to connect to our humanity in whichever form that is. So I think commercial decisions should never be based purely on kind of wanting to be PC or doing the right thing, but I don't think they have to be because I think actually being representative of society and telling stories with universal appeal essentially in one way or another end up being about our humanity and those are the things that sell. So I think in that order, that's why having kind of things which reflect social justice will always be commercial and where they haven't been in the past is essentially for want of a better word gatekeepers you know or, or predefined notions of who should be published why they should be published and who we should be publishing for i agree that, that that's spot on i would also add that um it, that the publishing for social justice also takes place in in the bookshop spaces where people come together and talk about those books and and that moves conversations on and that leads to more social justice thank you both so much for your wonderful talks and a really inspiring discussion thank you to our audience as well uh, for all your questions i'm now going to hand over to margareta jolly um, who's going to tell you more about the other events we have lined up for you this afternoon Thank you. Also, um, really, really inspiring. And I, I'm just going to begin by saying I'm, I'm fascinated with all the comments coming in that are saying the same, you know, thank you. This is exciting and interesting, um, you know, really surprising event, um, opening up my, my perspective on the business. Um, I will say there's a number of questions about how do I get in touch or, you know, I'm, I'm interested in advice on um, a particular book that you're working on. I'm presuming the answer there is to look on your website to pitch in the usual way. Um, both of your uh, the, thing, the things you've talked about are all available online. So I guess that's the, uh, the answer. Um, I'm afraid there were too many to, for us to deal with in this short time we had together. Um, but that also would include um, people interested in writing for screen and television and film and own it. This is another uh, interesting aspect, I think, of what you're doing, that is to, to talk to that uh, industry as well. Uh, so I just want to thank you both for a wonderful discussion, um, as well as the audience for your thought provoking questions. And of course, to invite you to join us for the rest of the festival, um, which will be continuing very shortly. Um, at two o'clock, so that's in an hour, we have another a session on reprinting lost classics and I think we we're probably all appreciative that's a really distinctive um, element of feminist business and I think it has particular importance again in thinking about heritage in the past this conversation we're all having about the past the present and the future um, so join us for that with Kate MacDonald and Maria Vashilupasas uh, from the British Library and uh, also with um, DM Withers as chair and then we have Making Feminist Comics with Nicola Streeton at five. Bring your pencil and paper for that one if you want to have a go yourself. Um, you can just, I should say, attend that without actually taking part if you want to, but I'm sure it would be fun to, to have a go drawing um, and she'll, she's the expert. She'll tell you how to do it, even if you've never tried before. On Friday, we close with a panel debate on the feminist marketplace. 
this will bring together our big questions about how to do creative but also ethical business within a capitalist economy and world. If you miss anything, all will be recorded and available on the British Library's website. If you want to know more about the Business of Women's Words project, check out our blog. Again, thank you all and also especially to our wonderful chair, Eleanor Careless. See you soon. <laughs>